Welcome to week one of Leadership of the Future. We're so glad to have you here. It's very exciting to have all the alumni here for this opportunity today. My name is Gareth Waugh. I'll be your host for this series. And before we get started, I've got an important, an important announcement to share. Ag Forestry is starting to recruit for Class 44, our premier leadership program, Ag Forestry. So as an alumni of the program, I can share that you know, the um, legislative knowledge that I gained through the program is very valuable to me, particularly as we just started session yesterday. It's allowed me to understand what's going on and, and how I can influence the program. So, um, you know, many of you may know people that would be interested in the ag forestry experience. What has changed this year is that we're requiring that applicants attend an applicant Q&A session, which you can see on your screen there, February 15, March 16, and April the 6th, uh, with applications opening there on March 15. So think about those in your life who would benefit from ag forestry. And um, yeah, please get those people thinking about it now so they're ready to apply when applications open on March 15th. Thank you. So it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Debbie Heiser. Debbie's an inspirer, a servant leader, organizer, connector, mother, speaker, facilitator, friend, and volunteer. With 30 years of business experience, including leading, managing, and coaching, she now helps entrepreneurs make a lot of money doing what they love without sacrificing what's important to them so they can have the business and life they dreamed of. Debbie is a thought leader and adjunct professor for Gonzaga University. She is active with community nonprofits and she provides business and leadership coaching, as well as a podcast through her business, Lead Your Life with Debbie Heiser. Now, before I hand it over to Debbie, let's review our question etiquette for this session. Please use the Q&A function located along the bottom of your screen to submit questions. You can ask a question at any time throughout the presentation and I will be monitoring those questions. So any clarifying questions, we will interrupt the presentation to work on those, but other questions more generic, we'll leave those to the end. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Debbie. Welcome, thank you. I'm really excited to hear your presentation. Great, thank you, Gareth. And thank you, um, good day to all of you. Um, and thank you, I'm so sorry, my view just changed, so I need to exit there. Um, thank you for joining us today. I am thrilled and honored that Hannah reached out to me to introduce you to servant leadership. And I would ask you in the chat, if you've had any experience with servant leadership or know a little bit about servant leadership, just throw it in the chat so that I kind of can see where everybody's at um, when it comes to having an understanding of what servant leadership is. Um, my mentor and friend, Dr. John Horsman, states that we're servant leaders in training. And thank you, Jennifer, for um, stating that you don't have any experience. That means I have a wide open canvas with you. Um, so Dr. John Horsman, who is a retired professor from Gonzaga University, states that we're servant leaders in training. And meaning that we're really consistently learning um, new and better ways to lead people. Robert Greenleaf, an AT&T leader, coined the phrase of servant leadership and wrote many essays and has a lot of works on the subject. Larry Spears, who knew Robert Greenleaf and ran the Greenleaf Center for many years, read all of his works and essays and determined that there were really 10 characteristics of a servant leader. And there are some characteristics I want to let you know that don't necessarily fall within the 10 that have been grouped together, but that really embody throughout all 10. And one that comes up for me a lot is courage. And talking about courage for just a minute, I want you to add in the chat um, some statements and let us know why you think it's important to be courageous as a leader. Anybody? I feel like Ferris Bueller, although I'm aging myself, some of you may not have even seen that movie. But when we think about courage as a leader, it takes an amount of courage to step in, have hard conversations with people, stand up good for what's right, even when it's hard, making hard decisions. Absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer and Kelly. Now, within these 10 characteristics, courage is woven all the way through, and there are others in there like integrity, honesty, that are woven in throughout all of this. And so as we look at doing the right things for the right reasons at the right time, thank you, Richard, I want to look at what servant leadership really is. And so Hannah, if you could switch the slide for me. 
<clears throat> Robert Greenleaf, this is kind of the acid question that we use in the realm of servant leadership. The servant leader is a servant first. It begins with that natural feeling that one wants to serve. That conscious choice then brings one to aspire to lead. And the best test is, do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? And so let's talk a little bit about what a servant leader is not before we go into the 10 characteristics. The word servant sometimes can get a really bad rap and be thought of as soft or something that's not desirable. And when you think about being a servant leader, it's not someone who lays over and lets people walk all over them. It's not somebody that is constantly about collaboration. Um, it's not it's not a style. You know, we hear about leadership styles, really servant leadership. It's about how you are in the world, how you, how you be with everyone. So it's not just when you're at your organization working, it's outside of that. How do you treat other people? How do you go about working with your family or in volunteer situations? So being a servant leader requires honesty, courageousness, congruency in our words and our actions. And most importantly, it means you want to serve others in the world. And if you think about it, I'd like to know from all of you, just with a simple yes, do you feel like you've got your bigger purpose figured out? Like, why are you here on this earth? And when you think about helping others be them, their best selves, I know for me, I'm a teacher, I'm a connector, and I'm an inspirer. And if I have those three things, then I know that I'm in my space. I'm in my level of genius, and I'm able to lead people and help them get into their best selves. Oh, good. I'm glad to see some of you say yes. And so knowing that in my core, the way I maneuver in the world is about connection, growth, and helping others be them best, their best selves helps me then to lead in a servant leadership position. So being a servant leader in training. Now, what do you think are some of the most important components of being a leader that serves others? And throw that in the chat. And Amanda, one of these days, your bigger purpose will come to you. But what do you think are important components of being a servant leader? Caring, listening, great. Supporting your staff. Yeah, and Julia, what does support look like? Listening to others. Yeah, Gretchen, we're going to talk about listening. Removing roadblocks. Good. Okay. So these are some things that potentially we need to look at as leaders. And when you think about the 10 characteristics, let's take a look at them. Now, this week, we're going to look at five of them. And one of the caveats I need to put out there is we were even talking before this started that literally there is a master's program at Gonzaga that is two and a half years in length that goes through leadership, but has an emphasis in servant leadership. So there are some entire courses built around a characteristic. So please know that we're touching the surface of many of these characteristics. And I will put a plug in because we have a certificate in servant leadership course starting on Monday, the 17th, that still has some openings. If you go out and Google at Gonzaga, their certificate programs, it is a nominal fee, um, but well worth the money. And um, there's also scholarships available. So take a look at that if you have more interest. So let's look at what those 10 characteristics are. When we think about the characteristics of servant leadership, um, thank you, Hannah, for changing the slide. It is listening. And that that's kind of the basis really for any any type of servant leader or any leadership period is really listening. There's empathy. How do we feel with people? There's healing, which might be a surprise to some of you. There's awareness. There is the commitment to the growth of people. Oh, thank you, Gareth, for putting that in there. Um, in the chat is the link for the certificate program. So the commitment to the growth of people, those are the five we're going to look at today. And then next week, we'll dig into conceptualization, foresight, stewardship, 
persuasion and building community. Now I'd like to find out from you, are there any on this list that surprise you as being a characteristic of being a servant leader? I know when I first looked at this list many, many years ago, persuasion surprised me that it was on there. Any surprises here? Healing. Yeah, Rosa, we're going to talk about healing. Anyone else have some that surprised them? Okay, well, we're going to move on. Let's, okay, we're going to spend some time today on healing and uh, healing is one of my favorite topics. So hopefully I won't squirrel out too much on that. So let's move on to listening. And Hannah, if you would go ahead and change the slide for me. And when we think about listening, what's listening really have to do with it? And I'd like to know from you, and I know I keep asking you to throw things in the chat, but it's a way for me to interact with you. I want to know when you think about your day and you have to split it up in a pie and you have a certain percentage of time that you sleep. And I hope most people get close to eight hours of sleep. But when you think about what percentage of time do you think you spend, not just as a leader, but that you spend listening, listening to yourself. Hannah, I don't know what happened, but the slide moved. Yeah, thank you. Listening to yourself, listening to others, listening to your family, listening to podcasts. What percentage of time do you think you listen every day? Throw it in the chat, please. And as you're doing that, I want you to think about the fact that listening is really about hearing what's said and what's not said. Yeah, look at these percentages coming through. Yeah, 85 to 90%, 40%. Yeah. And I will tell you, listening is the basis to all of it. Sometimes it's listening to your teams. Sometimes it's listening to colleagues. Sometimes it's listening to clients or customers that you have. It's listening to vendors that you have. All sorts of different avenues that we can listen and learn more about what we can do to improve. So Otto Scharmer out of MIT developed these four stages of listening. And then Dr. John Horseman mapped these to human development. And he's really kind of the Yoda of servant leadership. And he developed these concepts further. So if you would, Hannah, switch to slide five. The four levels of listening. The first one is about downloading. And in the chat, I want you to type yes. If you've ever been part of a conversation where someone's really, they're not listening to you, but they want you to hear them loud and clear. Like all they're doing is coming at you with what they believe, what they want to do. And I will tell you, I've seen so much more of that over these last couple of years as things have become even more polarized with people where we're not as open to hearing each other. Yeah, monologue versus a discussion. Absolutely, Richard. And so when you think about this first level of listening, we're listening from habits of judgment and we have old opinions. It's very polite routines and empty phrases. It's all about me, right? Like if I'm the one downloading, it's all about me and it's not about listening to someone else. Kelly, I love your answer. Of course I have. Um, when you think about, there's very minute things that happen during the day that we're in a downloading um, part of listening. So if you think about how many of you, I'm sure all of you have had where people say, or you even do, hi, how are you? And immediately people say, I'm fine. Or although it's much harder to go into a store these days and have someone actually come up to you, but it used to be, you'd walk into a store and someone would say, hi, can I help you? And immediately you say, no, thank you. I'm just looking. So this is another example of not listening, right? You're just immediately responding with something that you want to say. Now, here's a few different ways that you can change it up. And I'm gonna challenge you as you work with people, as you see people to change this up a little bit. You can ask, hi, how's your heart? That stops people and they're like, whoa, somebody hasn't ever asked me that before. Or what's the best thing that happened to you today? And so if you, if you do this, I know I used to do this even at the dinner table. I'd ask my family, particularly my son, I wouldn't say, how was your day? Because he would say, fine. I would say, what was the best thing that happened to you today? So if you have some ideas on ways to change that up and kind of throw yourself and others for a loop to knock you out of this downloading, throw those in the chat. I'd love to hear some of those. Now, when we talk about downloading, again, it's almost... Um, 
it's not the vomiting that sometimes people do when they're, they're speaking, but it's really about them and they want to get their point across. Now, the second level, Hannah, if you'd switch the slide for me, is about factual listening. Oh, I love that. The highs and lows. What made you smile today? Love those. Thank you for sharing those. So as we move into the second level, it's about factually listening. So it's about conversation, but you have your point of view and you say what you think, and you're not really open to hearing others' opinions or thoughts. Now you tend to compare and contrast old and new data. And so in your mind, you're kind of, you're determining, do I, do I want to be open to this conversation? Do I not want to be open to this conversation? And your mind is starting to shift and open slightly to be more open and effective. And in order to do this, though, we also need to suspend the voice of judgment. We all have this voice of judgment. And it's important to kind of put that aside and then ask clarifying questions to understand more about what's happening on the other end. Now, as we move into level three, Hannah, if you'd help me switch the page here. Um, empathetic listening is where you're listening from others within. So it's listening not only with your head, but also with your heart. It's about sensing sometimes what's not being said. It's about seeing from another's perspective. And empathy is feeling with people. And we're going to talk a little bit more about empathy here in a bit. But when you think about this, we try to see from that other person's perspective. We try to walk a mile in their shoes. And I want to know from you, in situations where you've been in an empathetic listening, where someone is really listening to you, how does that make you feel? When they're focusing on you and your story and that it matters, or you have an opinion about a process that you're using within your organization and someone's listening to you and it matters, how does that make you feel? And so, yes, I'm using the F word and making you feel. Um, it is hard to put the voice of cynicism aside. Thank you. Yeah, you feel respected and valued and important. You feel like you've been seen. And so when you think about that, I always ask that question because the feelings that you have about that, the people that you lead have the same feelings. And so being able to create a culture, and we're going to talk a little bit more about culture, where people can listen in an empathetic way and then move into level four is, is a way to allow for this to happen and have those feelings where people do feel valued, particularly in a world right now when people are so far apart in certain things. So looking at whether or not your opinion matters and if people are willing to listen to you and that culture is, is where you set the stage for this. So what happens is when you start to move into empath empathetic listening and move into the next stage of listening, it actually helps with employee engagement. It helps with less turnover. And so I want you to think about situations in your workplace where potentially you've seen it make a difference in other people's lives. You can throw it in the chat or not, but just think about that. This last level is about presencing. And, you know, there's an old saying that says, when you look in the past, it creates depression. When you look in the future, it creates anxiety, but being present creates joy. And sometimes I know I find it hard to sometimes be present in the moment because I'm thinking about what's coming next, um, or I'm doing some reflection and it's so important to be present. And it's about not squirreling off on a tangent of a story or fading off as someone else is speaking. It's generative. And I, I want to know from you, like when I say the word generative, what does that mean to you? Generative is really about creating dialogue without an agenda. It's allowing other people to respond. In level one and level two, people react from an emotional perspective. Richard, thank you. Yeah, it's thought provoking, makes you feel seen, it allows space. Absolutely, thank you for those. And so what happens is it creates this dialogue without an agenda and the agenda really is just to listen and respond and not react. When we react, that's a different level. That's level one and two. When we take it in and we actually process it, allow some stillness, allow some silence, we're not interrupting each other to get our points across, then we welcome that stillness to process and come back with some additional responses. 
One thing I've appreciated about Zoom is it kind of forces, sometimes it's an awkward silence, but it forces a silence as people go to take themselves off of mute and allows people a chance to process a little bit. Now, this fourth level of listening about presencing is really being in the flow of conversation. One of my favorite exercises is to have somebody, whether it be on Zoom or in person, and you just look at them and spend one or two minutes saying, I'm observing this. There's a softening of your eyes. And then they respond with something that they observe about you to create a generative dialogue. Now, this part of it is opening up your will to then be influenced and listening both outside of yourself and internally, and it's all inclusive. And so when we look at listening as the basis of where we're heading, it really then allows us to show empathy to people. So Hannah, if you would go ahead and move to the empathy slide. And I want to ask you, and I want to see some things in the chat here. What's the difference between empathy and sympathy? Or is there a difference? Anybody have some thoughts on that? Yeah, Lindsay, thank you. You can personally relate to others. Acceptance of the situation. Sympathy is taking on others' feelings. Yeah, thank you for that because we're 100% responsible for ourselves and 100% responsible to others. I'm not responsible for other people, but I'm responsible to show up as my best self for them, being in their shoes and not feeling sorry for them. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So empathy really, and I mentioned this early, is about feeling with people. It's about understanding where they're at. And sometimes as a leader, this is a hard situation for people. You know, a lot of times, and I'll admit, even in, in the multiple studies I've done about leadership, there's not a lot of really good training for leaders on how to handle difficult conversations, about how to handle when someone's upset about something that you can't do anything about. And we're going to talk about being a rescuer here in a little bit. And so as we look at empathy, there's such a great video that I just think for the three and a half minutes says everything there is to say about being empathetic. And so... I'm going to ask that uh, Hannah start the video, and if you would uh, take a look, it's a pretty humorous little video. Thank you, Hannah. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, you climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no. You want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us, it's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, 
I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Great. Thank you, Hannah. Now, it's interesting because it is a bit humorous, but it's so true, right? And how many of you at work, and feel free to just put an emoji or anything in the chat, but how many of you have ever heard in your career, when you're at work, keep your personal life at home? Anyone ever hear that? I'm hoping not, but yeah, unfortunately, right? And so we're holistic. So that's really not even possible. And I personally disagree with this. And to show empathy, it's about understanding at a level three or level four listening capacity, what's happening in your teams or with your employees before making a judgment. So I have an example of where this plays out in a work, in a work situation. There was a woman that hired me actually um, in my first job. And later throughout my time at this company with Sprint, she became an instructional designer for me. And one week she called me and was late three times. And when I talk late, you know, Midwest, we worked eight to five and she was coming in around 1030 and she was tagging her car. Well, in the state of Missouri, you tag your car once a year. So in three times in a week, there was no way she could have tagged her car. So I finally, I pulled her aside and I go, Joanne, what's going on? Like, you said to me that you've tagged your car three times and that leads me to not trust you because I don't know if that's the truth because you can't tag your car three times. So just tell me what's happening. So she went on to tell me that what would happen is she would take her computer home with her and she's a night owl. And so she would like at midnight, all of a sudden have these like bursts of creativity and would sit there and create training materials from midnight until 4 a.m., fall asleep, and then have a hard time getting up to be at work by eight o'clock. And so she'd come dragging in at 1030. Well, so I listened to that and I thought, what's going on here? Why can't she come in at 1030? So we actually changed her work schedule. Now it was important. We communicated it with the rest of the team because perception is reality until proven differently. But then she was able to be more productive and happier as an employee. Now with what's happened over the last two years, there's many of us that have been in situations where we've been in different work environments than we have in the past potentially. And I know Brene Brown terms that the big awkward is about to happen as more and more people come back to the workplace. And I don't know how many of you, so if you would maybe throw in the chat for me, how many of you, your work changed pretty drastically as far as where you worked from and potentially how you interacted with each other over the last couple of years? So empathy is about um, feeling with people. And it's important then that we're aware because we can't really feel with people if we're not aware. I, I can't remember what this is called and I should have looked it up. But there's a phenomenon that, for instance, when I had a major life event, when my mom passed away, all of a sudden, all of these people came into my life that had had a similar situation of a parent passing away. Or if, um, if I was in a situation where I bought a new car, all of a sudden I'm seeing white Subarus everywhere where I didn't see them in the past. And so part of this being able to be, have empathy is then also creating this awareness. Yeah. Thank you. It sounds like some of you have had some changes and some of you not as much. So go ahead and turn, if you would, um, Hannah, to the next slide about awareness. When we think about awareness, it's not only for our employees, and which right now we're sensing more and more stress, more and more sensitivity as stress levels go up. And as we continue to come back to places of employment, even if things haven't changed for you and your employees, there's other people that your teams are interacting with that potentially are going through kind of this big awkward movement of coming back to work. So keeping aware of that and just being aware of those heightened sensitivities that maybe vendors might have or clients might have because they're changing the way they've been working over the last two years is important. There is this um, model here that I have on this slide. And if you're familiar with Johari's window, just throw in there so I can see that you are familiar with it. But basically this model shows this idea of awareness. And when we understand ourselves, we learn to not take things so personally. And we learn to realize that not everything is about us. 
And we can then become more empathetic and understanding. And now that doesn't mean that the work doesn't get done because we have businesses to run and it's important to make sure that this happens, but it can also be done in a really compassionate way, um, similar to the example that I gave you about Joanne. In the chat, I want you to put down one thing that is known to you and known to others or what falls into this open self category. So jot in there one thing that you know and you know that others know about you fairly easily. For instance, people know that I have blonde hair and I know I have blonde hair. Analytical, Richard says, good, you're friendly like to talk about things agriculture. John, that doesn't surprise me. That's part of who you are, it sounds like. Being kind, good. Yeah, so these are things that we're open about, people know about us, we know about them. And so as an example of me with the blonde hair, if we move into the hidden self piece of it, this is information about you that you know, but that others don't know. So using my blonde hair as an example, I am not blonde anymore, but rather my hairstylist does a really phenomenal job of making it look natural, or I hope it looks natural. And this is ex an example then of what I know, but it's hidden from others potentially. And this can be much deeper and it usually is, and I'm just using that as an example, but I want you, can you think of something that is hidden maybe, and maybe it doesn't need to be hidden, that it might make you a little bit more vulnerable but it might make you more approachable for your teams to understand you a bit better. The iceberg, yeah, know the surface, but not what's underneath, absolutely. Very similar to this. So when you think about, there are some places sometimes that we step behind a mask instead of sharing as a leader that, and again, you don't wanna overshare, please, please hear me here. You don't wanna overshare, but sometimes opening up and being a little bit vulnerable as a leader and sharing things that are happening allows them to feel that sense of safety and creates a culture where people feel safe sharing with each other what's happening. And then how many of you, and I wanna see this in the chat so everybody get ready. There's not a prize, but how many of you know someone that knows something about you, but you don't know it about yourself? And type yes. Okay, good, you, you're all getting here. So it's a little bit of a trick question because we all should have said yes, because we all have things that are our blind spots. And when we set the culture for our teams, I want you to think about, is it one that someone could approach you as their leader to provide you with feedback to help you if you're unaware of something? Do people feel safe when you provide them feedback about what might be blind to them. Now, I have to share a story with you. I have a couple of friends that, you know, they call me on my stuff. And it's really important in my life for me to have that. And I'm such an extrovert. And now that I live by myself, I process out loud as an extrovert. And sometimes when I'm processing out loud, people take it as criticism, or they're not certain if I'm talking to them or not. And so they gave me this feedback that said, you got to stop doing that. And that was such a blind spot. I didn't even realize it was happening. And I was so grateful that they talked to me about that because now I have to be really aware of it so that I can change that, that habit that I have. And so I want you to think about if there was a time in your life when someone gave you feedback and maybe you didn't want to hear it, but it was really better for you. I think of feedback as a gift. And as a leader, one of the things that I like to try to do with people that in my past have reported to me at both Citibank and at Sprint is to create a culture where people can feel safe to do that, where they can give each other honest feedback. And you know then that people are going to be honest about other things if they're giving you that honest feedback. Um, okay, what is DPM, Gareth? I need to know more about this. Um, so I want you to think about that time and, and really kind of resonate on that and how that made you feel. And sometimes we don't want to hear it. And so there's a little bit of um, maybe pushback at first, and we fall into that level one and level two because we want to be right um, versus being open to it, but trying to create that culture. Um, and then this last one is this unknown self. And so these are those areas that you don't know and other people don't know about you. And sometimes they may appear in your future. And so how does all of this fit together? 
as we listen, as we show empathy, that we realize and become aware of our own blind spots, then we can step into healing, healing ourselves and helping other people to hear, heal. Now, many of you were surprised about healing being one of the 10 characteristics. Some people get a little wigged out by this and think, oh my gosh, I'm not a counselor. But I will tell you as leaders, we spend a lot of time just listening to people and allowing them to just be heard, um, which is a little bit like counseling. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of tools that I found really helpful, not only in life, but also as a leader, so that you can become more aware of yourself and you can help identify it in other people so that as a leader, you can step back and sometimes not take things personally, but realize that someone who's hurting, they're going to react in a certain way about certain things. So Hannah, if you would move to the slide about transactional analysis, has anybody ever heard of transactional analysis before? It's been around for a little while um, and there's different names for this, but really what this says is that we have an inner family in our heads. You really have four people that live in your head, in your brain. You have the young child, you have the adolescent, you have the critical parent and the mature adult. Now, what do these mean? So how many of you, and put an emoji or anything into the chat, how many of you have young children at home, you know, toddlers or have had a toddler or a grandchild that is younger right now? Yeah, thank you for the smiley face, Jennifer. Young children, oh, two toddlers. Um, Jean, <laughs> wow, um, that would be a lot for me. But two toddlers, when you think about toddlers, they are, they are just emotion. They are all heart. One minute, they're super excited. The next minute, they're mad and they're crying. And then the next minute, they're hugging you and loving on you. And they are just pure emotion. This young child or this little girl or little boy is our heart. And interestingly enough, some of you might be going, okay, I'm losing it now because this is a little woo woo -y. But really, when you think about being a leader, how many of you, and I want to see a thumbs up or a, an emoji in the chat, how many of you have to be innovative in your work? You have to think about things and make decisions and be innovative. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. Innovation is just an adulting word for being creative and having an imagination. And your little girl or your little boy is that, that inner person with you that has that creativity, has that imagination. And when we lock that little girl or little boy in a closet like Harry Potter, it, it, it stumps our creativity. And so I work with people privately and a lot of times I'll tell them go to Target or to Walmart and pick up some finger paints and finger paint, get back in touch with that young child who is you inside there so that you can be creative and be thoughtful about what you do. So now the adolescent, how many of you have teenagers? <sighs> And I kind of laugh because teenagers, I like to say that they are the rebel without a cause and they just like to rebel. Yeah, a lot of you have teenagers. So they just like to rebel. They're trying to figure out who they are, right? And the adolescent serves us well in some ways, but then in other ways doesn't serve us so well. So the adolescent is that person that if someone said to you, you could never be a director in an organization, or you could never be the president of an organization, or you could never own your own business. And you say, watch me. That's your adolescent speaking. Now, the downfall to that is, is the adolescent tends to hang on to anger, right? If you think about an adolescent having two sides, like, huh, just watch me, I'm going to go do this. And then kind of having that that anger, that angry person. I find teenagers with all the hormones and everything else going on too. There's a lot of emotion, but it tends to be more angry type of emotion or sad type of emotion. Those aren't bad emotions. It just, those can be a little bit more destructive. So the adolescent is there. And then we have our critical parent. Now, let me back up for a second. Most of us live in our adolescent. We'd like to think we live in our mature adult. And if I would have thought, I would have had you put where you think you live most of the time in your inner family, but the critical parent, then if you think about maybe like three chairs sitting in your head, the child, the adolescent, and then your critical parent. Now this isn't your parent, but we do tend to parent ourselves even as our parents did. But anytime, I always say, anytime you find yourself shooting on yourself, that is a critical parent. 
the universal laws talk about there's no value placed on something until we compare it to something else. And so who says it should be done this certain way? And that's our critical parent coming out and criticizing what we're doing. I hear many people say to me, I'm my worst critic. And of course we are because our critical parent comes out a lot. And that's that self-worth, constantly knocking our self-worth. Now, the reason I talk about these three is the adolescent stands between the critical parent and the young child and tries to protect that young child. And the adolescent gets tired. So there's a lot of people on your teams with the stress, all of the sensitivity that's been happening in the world, the chaos energy that's out there that they were tired to begin with. And because they live in their adolescent, they're even more tired and burnt out. We're seeing more and more people with mental health um, being a big piece of what's happening right now. So you have those three and then your mature adult, their job is to tell the critical parent, button it, be quiet, sit down, and then make the adolescent and the young child feel safe. Listening to that adolescent, listening to that young child. And you might say, what does listen? How do you listen to that? It's listening to your heart, listening to your gut, your intuition about certain things. Hopefully, um, practicing adulting, two girls practicing adulting. That's great, Ted. Hopefully you haven't been in this situation, but I'm sure most of us have where you've been somewhere and you're like, mm, this isn't the place I need to be. That's your intuition talking to you. So that mature adult helps keep them safe. Now, why I go into this quite a bit is it creates healing and it allows you that when you see an employee react or get hooked by something emotionally, you realize they're in their adolescent or that their critical parent is coming out. I've had a lot of people come into my office and, you know, they did a great job on something, but they criticize themselves on how it was. And they make comments. Words are important. And when they make comments and do negative type of connotation towards themselves, then it just re-emphasizes the neuroscience that it's going into our subconscious brain. Okay, so you can tell I can spin off on this for a long time, but if you would, Hannah, go ahead and switch to the next slide. I wanna talk briefly about the victim game. And this is also called the drama triangle. And if you've heard of this before, please throw something in the chat. Um, but I want to explain how this can quickly happen, even within 30 seconds in your brain. Words are important, I mentioned. So I can be a victim because I say, oh, I have to take my car in and get it fixed. Well, no, I'm choosing to take my car in because I want a car to drive. And so that's where even those slight nuances of words and catching your employees and helping them see that changes it. Um, it's just like saying um, in, a, in a bit, I'm going to talk about the difference between saying I'm sorry and saying thank you for waiting for me. So it's those small changes. The persecutor is someone that wants to be right. If you find yourself arguing with someone, you're in your adolescent. If you're justifying why or why not you're doing something, that's your adolescent. And typically you're in the persecutor role. You want to be right. And so in your head, you might be saying, oh, something's happening and here I'm justifying all of this and this is why I want to do this. Well, is it really or is that the way you should go? And then the rescuer, this is an important one as leaders to know. As a rescuer, we swoop in and I was great at this with my son, who's now 29, at coming in and helping them out, right? We take value as leaders that we can help people. Well, the best help you can get someone is to step back ask better questions and let them come up with the answers. Let them do it because if we come in and rescue them on a project or we come in and take over in a project, we're telling them that we don't trust that they could do it. And so therefore they have a message in their subconscious brain that's saying, I can't do this. I need help with this. Now, sometimes people need help and it's important to ask for help, but that's where as a leader, if we can identify that we're stepping into that rescuer mode, it helps us to then lead our people in a better way. Okay, so enough on healing. And I want to know in the chat, if you would drop in if, if those things about healing made sense, and now give you some insight as to why it's important to heal as a leader and also to help other people heal. And again, these are semester long courses. So that was a really brief explanation. So if you would, Hannah, yeah, you're already there. The next um, is also about healing is about forgiveness and reconciliation. Thank you, Kelly. Part of healing is this reconciliation. And when you say, I'm sorry, it puts the focus on you. But if you ask for forgiveness, it puts the focus on the other person. 
And it also gives them control. And those of us that like to have control, this is harder to do. It's harder to say to someone, please forgive me, than it is to say, oh, I'm sorry. So the next time you hear yourself saying, I'm sorry, I'm late, for instance, instead of saying that, say, thank you for waiting or thank you for your patience. Um, it just puts the, the spotlight back on the other person. So there are many articles, books, movies, and stories about forgiveness and reconciliation. Invictus is one of my favorite about a rugby team in South Africa when Nelson Mandela takes over in South Africa. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. And I'd like to ask you, because frankly, I need to add to my list too, put in the chat a movie or a book that you can think of that shows reconciliation and, are, and a, a deep level of forgiveness. I think about Dances with Wolves. There's all sorts of great um, entertainment out there that that show how reconciliation can really help heal. Um, and there's also great YouTube videos out there um, about indigenous tribes, um, about uh, Ubuntu down in Africa that I would suggest you to take a look at. And I have some of these in a resource list that you'll get as well. Anybody have any movies or books or anything that they have seen? Waitress, yeah, that's a good one. Thank you, Brandy. Okay, well, if you think of some movies, throw them in there because I like to add to my list to share with people. And now let's go ahead and, and move on because when we think about listening, we think about empathy, we think about awareness, and we think about this healing piece of it. The last one is about being committed to the growth of people. And I'm going to ask you, how important is growth to you for yourself and for other people? How important is it to you to have a growth mindset? And are you consummate learners? I'd love to see a yes in there if you are. And if you have a, a great book that you've read recently, throw it in there. Yeah, very important. Thank you. Um, my guess would be that many of you are consummate learners or you wouldn't be a part of this class. And why do you think it's important to have a growth mindset as a leader? Um, and thank you. Many of you are saying it's important and yeah, stacks and stacks of book to read. Yes, Lindsay, I'm with you. Um, I switched to a Kindle so I didn't have to carry them all around. Um, but when you think about it, why is it important to have this growth mindset as a leader? So it's important for you. It's important to have collective growth also with your team, those people that you lead. And this helps create employee engagement and when you think about employee engagement, I would love to hear and for you to share with other people. Um, yes, it is the only constant is change, but I'd love for you to share with other people what you do to engage your teams with things. So put some ideas in there for your peers. We touched on culture earlier, and I'd like to ask you what type of culture you're cultivating. Um, I've had to point a few things out to people in the past, and they're kind of hidden areas. So such as how many of you choose to answer emails sometimes later at night or at a different time than the normal work hours because it's more convenient for you? And if you do, that's great, no judgment. But what I tell people is schedule the emails then to arrive the next day during the work hours, because there's a subtle message that those we lead receive if they see consistently that you're doing work outside of work. They start to think you're expecting it, even though it hasn't been said. So look at those little things that potentially give off a culture that maybe you're not wanting to necessarily cultivate. Now, McKinsey and company gathered some data about people's life satisfaction and how things are shifting with what's occurred over the last two years. What makes employees happy and engaged was kind of the question that they looked out. And it turns out our bosses or managers are a critical factor in this. And although the employee manager relationship was important before, it's intensified during the COVID-19 crisis. When tailoring work routines to individual needs and maintaining social connections made an enormous difference in workers' productivity and well-being. And so I wanted to take a look at just a few of these percentages. This is how it broke down. They said job satisfaction really relied heavily on those manager and leaders. And so really, I want you to take away from this too, to never underestimate the impact you have on others as you lead them. 
When we look at this, mental health was the largest driver of life satisfaction right now. And next to that was job satisfaction. And so if job satisfaction relies heavily on us as leaders, that's a pretty big responsibility that we, that we take. Relationships, physical health, and then other. When I look at physical health, I found this interesting that mental health and physical health have such a strong tie to each other, but yet it wasn't that important for people's life satisfaction. So I just found that kind of interesting. Now, when you think about helping others grow and develop, I would ask, do you look for projects or work that would be satisfying to members of your team that also allow them more visibility and growth within the company? One of the things that I train new leaders on is to be conscious of the story that you're telling to those that are your bosses about your people, because sometimes the only insight into your people is what you tell them. And so you're creating a picture of the people that you lead to those further up in the organization. And so thinking then too about some of the things that we've talked about, do you rescue and come in and do it yourself or do you allow people to grow? Do you ask a question, but if you don't get the answer, ask a better question. So these are the five characteristics that we looked at today. Next week, we'll go into the other five. And what I'd like to see in the chat before we completely turn it over to Q&A is what is one thing that you've picked up today that you feel you can take forward and make an immediate difference with after hearing about these first five um, characteristics. And then I'm going to open it up. So if you would throw that in the chat, but also open it up to any questions, Gareth, that we have from the group. Great, thanks so much, Gibby. Uh, don't see any questions just there at the moment, but as people are typing, I'd just like to ask, is, is there a way to help colleagues who sort of would really benefit from being more of a servant leader <laughs> um, and, and trying to help sort of, I guess, get that snowball effect going in an organization? Yeah, thank you, Gareth, for asking that. And so what I heard you ask was, is there a way to help people that we in our minds become a persecutor and say they need to do something different, right? Um, and they should do this. But as we all know, it's nice to work in an environment where people are servant leaders. And I would say the best way is to model to them. Um, I don't know how many of you have Apple TV. If you've seen Ted Lasso, please comment in the chat. One of the best leadership shows. Now there's a lot of cussing, so don't watch it with your children. And it's very European, but it just shows the kindness and how you can be a really effective leader and be kind and model it to other people that then um, falls over into other people then starting to take on some of that same persona. So if you haven't seen Ted Lasso yet, I highly recommend it. Okay. A lot of enthusiasm in the chat. Ted Lasso. Yeah, me too. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I think I, I should get a commission for as many people as I've sent to go watch that show. <laughs> I will say to you too, if you have some deeper questions that you would like to talk to me about, um, I am gifting everyone 30 minutes of my time. And if you go out to my website, um, www.leadyourlituplife.com. So that's L-I-T for lit up leadyourlituplife.com. There's a button there that says book a consult, or I don't remember what it says. Um, the person that does my website could tell you, but I think it's book a call. Maybe if you book a call, I'm happy to um, talk further about this. Um, and then next week we'll go into the other five. And the last week will be a panel with three members of, I want to say they're alumni, right, Gareth, from other classes um, that will be on to talk to you about how they apply servant leadership in their life and in their work. So any questions from you all about any one of these five? Yeah, thank you, Ted. It's a really great reminder. A movie list. Will you be sharing this? I can add some more movies to um, the list. Absolutely. I didn't add a lot. I have some books, websites, articles to read, um, as well as um, podcasts to listen to. One of the best podcasts I've heard that's helped me as a leader is the Happiness Lab by Maria, Dr. Maria Santos. Um, and uh, I think she's at Stanford, no, Harvard, and uh, created a happiness class, thought she'd have about 30 people and she ended up with about 3000 people in the class. Um, and so she started a podcast. So yes, Lindsay, I will add some movies to that list as well. 
Any other questions? Okay, in the essence of self-awareness, what's one thing then in the chat that you became aware of about yourself as a leader that um, you think you've been doing really well with? Thank you, Richard. Okay, I can tell people are like, I want my five minutes back. <laughs> Well, thank you, Debbie. I, I really appreciate your time today. And I know, you know, from listening to the presentation, I have a lot of things that I need to think about it. And I, I did particularly enjoy the transactional analysis framework. We'll do some more reading on that. So um, that'll, that will help explain some of my own reactions over time with my team. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some other things we've seen going on. So. And here's what I would say. Thank you for saying that, Gareth. As you, as you look at this and as you become self-aware, make sure you step back and look through the lens of curiosity and not judgment. We tend to then get into that critical parent and really judge ourselves, which is why I asked everybody to put like, what's something you think you do really well at, right? As a servant leader or as a leader. And so make sure you look with the lens of curiosity and not judging yourself and beating yourself up because you don't want to go into that dark hole. So. Uh, oh, just a question there about thank you for the great presentation. So. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I appreciate your time today and we'll look forward to rejoining next week and moving on to the second half of the list. Great. I'll see you next Tuesday. Everybody have a fabulous week. Thanks so much, Debbie. All the best. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thanks for joining us today. See you next week.